Welcome, everyone, to this December 16, 2016 edition of Global Newsmaker Focus on the KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station and Global Radio Alliance. This is Patrice Sheridan speaking. Tonight's program features guest Grant Cameron regarding his latest book, Inspired, The Paranormal World of Creativity. To quickly note our guest bio details from his author summary at the Clinton UFO Storybook, E.T. Politics in the White House by Grant Cameron. Grant Cameron is the recipient of the Leeds Conference International Researcher of the Year and the UFO Congress Researcher of the Year. He became involved in ufology as the Vietnam War ended in May 1975 with personal sightings of a UFO-type object, which locally became known as Charlie Red Star. These sightings led to a decade of research into the early work done by the Canadian government into the flying saucer phenomena. Cameron became the authority on the government program and Wilbert B. Smith, who headed it up. From here, Cameron proceeded to do almost two decades of research into the role of the President of the United States in the UFO mystery. Most of that investigation is found at the President's UFO website at presidentialufo.com. Cameron has lectured widely in Canada, the United States, and Europe. He was one of the 40 witnesses that testified in front of six ex-senators and congressmen in Washington for the citizens' hearing on UFO disclosure. He has appeared on many television documentaries on UFOs and has been interviewed by nearly 100 radio shows, including a number of appearances on Coast to Coast AM. Grant, thank you for taking the time to speak with us this evening on your latest book, Inspired, the paranormal world of creativity. Regarding your book this week, I found the research and concepts so informative, engaging, and startling. And anything we discuss this evening, listeners, represents only a microcosm of the information presented in your book. Welcome, Grant. Well, thanks for having me, Patrice. I really appreciate being on, and I appreciate your interest in, in what I'm doing, because um, I've done a lot of UFO stuff. And uh, what we're going to talk about tonight is the stuff I think is more important. It's uh, the stuff that really interests me, although it doesn't get as much attention as uh, evil aliens. But it's uh, extremely important when it comes to reality and understanding how the world works. Excellent. Well, now, Grant, your book presents extensive research and examples of discoveries, new innovations, and and knowledge gleaned from a right brain influence, but with its origination, a source outside of the right brain, a non-local source, which is the origin of this information. Could you explain how this right brain and non-local source of information generates new discoveries and information which propels humanity and civilization forward? Okay, um, basically, um, I, to, to sort of put it in perspective, I can tell you how it started with me. I was doing the UFO stuff, and I was mm-hmm. actually in your hometown. I was in Phoenix, Arizona. I was watching a lecture uh, by Colin Andrews, who's the crop circle guy, and he was talking about consciousness and crop circles, and I really didn't want to be in the room. It was at UFO Congress, which goes from 8 o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock at night every for a week. And so you don't go to all the lectures. I really didn't want to be in the room. And basically what happened was uh, I went there because he was a very prominent lecturer, and I figured I should pay him the respect to go and watch him lecture. I was in the room, and I sort of zoned out. I was sort of thinking about, well, maybe I should go do this, do that. And uh, I wasn't really paying attention. And that's when it happened. And that, I think, is in a nutshell, is how this actually works. It's not a talent that people have. Um, A lot of people think, and I point this out in the book, and if you look at the uh, research that was done by Dr. Uh, Nancy Andreasen from the University of Iowa, uh, most people think that uh, inspiration creativity comes from intelligence. And there was actually a study done, it started in 1921 at Stanford University, where they took 1,500 of um, these kids who had IQs of 135 or over to look at their ability to be creative 
And what they basically found after they shut the study down 2015, so this is a 94-year-long study uh, following these kids through their life, is that these kids were no more creative and maybe less creative than the average the average person. So people think it's got to do with 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 intelligence. It's got to do with uh, thinking things out. You, your rational left brain, analytical mind, and you get the evidence and you sort of uh, your brain works and it sort of uh, puts pieces together of a puzzle. And that's exactly not how it works. What how it works is the way it happened with me. Is you're sitting in a room and you sort of zone out. And what it is 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 uh, instead of an ability you have, it's the ability to shut down. It's the ability to quiet the mind, whether it's through uh, hypnosis, whether it's through psychedelics, whether it's through uh, meditation. Uh, and we now know a number of different methods for doing this. So what you do is you actually shut down the chatter. You shut down the uh, rational analytical left brain. And it's maybe not that the right brain is doing it, but the right brain, uh, once you shut down the ego mind or the, the sort of the rational analytical mind, it allows whatever is tapping into non-local consciousness. And the idea, if you look at uh, some of the musicians that I quoted or inventors that I quoted, uh, basically a lot of them would say that all that stuff is out there, especially musicians will say. Uh, in fact, Ozzy Osbourne has just, um, uh, um, I, I haven't got it in the book, but Ozzy Osbourne has actually made a statement, where do you think music comes from? And he said, I think it's all written already, and all you do is tap into it, and you're like the scribe. You're the guy that, that actually writes it out. And in the book, I actually go back through um, ancient music, because my mother was a church organist, and the first time I ever gave this lecture on creativity, and especially music, because there's a very big connection between um, uh, rock music and um, UFOs. A lot of uh, musicians are very interested in UFOs, and a lot of them are talking about this down, download inspiration thing, where uh, I, um, I have a, actually a list. I have a list of 150 who say they got it in dreams. I got a, a list of over 100 musicians who say that they wrote a song in under 30 minutes, that it just suddenly came to them. And so people think it's this rational radical thing, but it's actually the ability to shut down and to tap into this this uh, field of non-local consciousness and that's where all the answers are and so when you start looking at the inventions and the creativity stuff you find that this is uh, it all sort of makes sense and what happened to me when, when I did the ancient music was uh, when I first brought this up people um, were very religious I was at uh, Boulder Colorado I was giving a lecture and uh, somebody stood up and said no this uh, thing with musicians this isn't uh, download from angels or um, uh, uh, aliens. This is uh, these people are getting this stuff from the devil. And I went, really? And 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 there, somebody else stood up and said, yeah, I think it's the devil. And I went, what? Are you kidding me? And and I thought like this is uh, you know the year twenty whatever it was twenty fourteen. I'm thinking you can't be serious. And and the people were getting up and walking out. And it was like a, it was it just blew me away. So that's when I started looking at ancient music. And so because my mother was a church organist, my father built their theater organs. My two sisters uh, were uh, musicians that played in a religious group that toured the country. And so I had a lot of backing. I didn't it wasn't musical myself. But I came from a musical family, and so I went and looked at uh, music from Bach, Handel, Beethoven, all this uh, stuff that ends up in, in church music, and it was the same story. All they did was change the, the, the noun. Instead of saying it was coming from um, an angel or from uh, aliens, they would say it was coming from the hand of God, it was coming from uh, dead people. A lot of people will talk about uh, meeting a former, uh, say, composer, who gave them a song, and you, you see this kind of stuff over and over and over. And so what I did was I put the book together because I had my own download experience, and and when I had it, and I, and I say to people, it's not that you have a good idea. This inspiration download thing, when you've actually had it, it's like a UFO sighting, because when it came, uh, it came instantly. It was like boom, 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 all this stuff came into my head, and it just sort of put all this material together, and I was so amazed by what had happened that, that, that I had gotten this uh, answer. And, the, and the, the, what I had been given, the download I got, was to say that the entire UFO situation, everything that has to do with UFOs, the basic, the bottom line to this whole thing to understand what's going on is non-local consciousness. And it put all the pieces together, and all the pieces went together, and I went, wow, that's how it works. It was like, wow, I could, couldn't believe it. It was like, yeah, I know. And it comes with 
which is hard to describe. It comes with absolute certainty. And you'll hear people describe this over and over again. It comes with absolute certainty. You do not have to question this. You don't have to do an experiment. This is how it works. And so you, you'll have this situation where um, Feynman talks about it, the, the, the guy who won the Nobel Prize for Physics, and he's talking um, with Fred Hoyle, who should have won the two Nobel Prizes. He was the inventor of the, um, the whole idea about um, uh, carbon being used as a basic element of, of life and supernova type stuff. And they're talking about this. And when I lecture on this, I actually play a video of these two guys talking. And they're walking along this road, and they're talking about the moment of invention, the moment of inspiration. And they, they're getting all excited. And Feynman says, it's unbelievable. He says, do you remember? He says, you're sitting there. You can actually see the color of the paper and the pen you were writing with. And, and, and it just relates back to what happened to me. It comes with this absolute certainty. And then it crosses over into the UFO world. And most people maybe not do not know that you have a group which's called experiencers people who haven't had seen so much seen a UFO but who have interacted with the beings and the free research that's done Edgar Mitchell's uh, free organization has 2900 experiencers who have filled out this these survey with 600 questions and in there they are asked about at any point did you get mathematical technical or scientific material that appeared in your head that you did not get from school or from learning it from somewhere else. And 42% of all those people say, yeah, I got that. I got, and I had, I've had people come to me, secretaries who have never, no scientific background, whatever, and actually show me on their cell phone, or show me a paper, 25 pages long with mathematical formulas that just popped into their head. And so th this is what it comes down to is, is understanding this creativity thing and this link, this very important link to experiencers who 42% of these 2,900 experiencers are saying, yes, they've had this download experience. And what's even more important to understand about this experience, and this goes back to this thing about musicians saying it's all written down, it's all there. Of these 2,900 experiencers, of the people who filled out the, who answered the question, the question was, at any point during your experience, did you know the answer, did, did you know the answer to everything? And f almost 40% of them said, Yes, at some point during their experience, they knew the answer to everything in the universe. And I said, well, wow, man, this is extremely important. And it, it, draw, it falls away. When, once they, the, the abduction experience ends, they suddenly lose this. And the same happens in near-death experiences, where people will say, I knew the answer to everything. I had it there, and I said, I'm going to remember this. And as I was coming back, it started to fade away like a dream. It was fading away. That's extremely important to realize that this material probably is there in some sort of field of non-local consciousness. And so it becomes the ability to tap into that field. And as I said, I, we actually now understand how you do this. And a lot of people use different techniques for doing it. But you can actually tap into this field and tap into this um, field of non-local consciousness, which is almost like the Internet. It's like getting the password onto the Internet and being able to tap in and put your Google search and pull whatever answer you want out of there. Uh, yes, you mentioned that analogy with Google. Uh, now also, uh, Grant, on the UFO ET connection, uh, you just mentioned Renero uh, or Ray Hernandez, Ray yeah. Hernandez yeah. Uh, Attorney Hernandez. He's also an MCP and PhD candidate, a uh, tax attorney, co-founder of the Free Foundation or the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial Encounters. Do you perceive Ray Grant as an example of those coming forward in various fields to express the material they have received from ETs through downloads? Oh, absolutely. Ray and I have very weird synchronistic uh, relationship to each other um, as, as you know his story it was actually his wife his wife is a, a, a full-blown experiencer she can sort of call the ships in and uh, they have this experience um, that happens in um, March of 2012 this is the experience where um, his wife is the dog is um, their dog is 16 years old it's uh, suddenly um, become paralyzed, um, and the wife is downstairs taking the dog 
out to to go to the bathroom and they're gonna they're gonna take it to the vet on the next day and have it euthanized and um, suddenly she's yelling at Ray come down come down come here come here and and he's he's lying in bed and he's he's it's Sunday morning and he's going leave me alone I want to sleep like you know, and finally she keeps yelling and so finally he comes down and he sees this he calls it a bar of light in the in the in the room and um, he goes what what do you do? whatever and he goes back to bed and he's lying in bed and he's thinking what the heck would what, I do you know so he goes running back downstairs to see if the bar of light is still there and his his wife is there with the dog and the dog has been cured the dog is like a like a puppy it's jumping all over the place and stuff like that and so he becomes um, sort of enthralled with this whole situation with this curing of his dog now this happened a week after I have that download experience in Phoenix Arizona and so then he he realizes that there's this connection and that his wife is able to bring these ships in so he goes out the one night and he says you know i want to see the the ships that my wife saw and he's trying to do this mental thing and he says you know with the with the windows like like uh um like church windows with uh, stained glass i want to see the 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 thing and he says ah nothing really happens then he's about to go back in the house and he looks and he said it was like wembley stadium over top of the next door neighbor's house it's huge and he calls his, his daughter out and she sees it and so he becomes obsessed he realizes that you can actually tap into um bringing these things down and he realizes consciousness and he makes a contact to me and he says you're doing consciousness and ufos and so I said, well, I'm going to be in Florida, and I'm going to be lecturing there at Sebring, and why don't you come down, and we'll have a talk, and I'm giving a lecture on consciousness. So he comes down to the lecture, and he sees the lecture. We talk with his wife, and we, they tell their story and, and all this sort of stuff, and his wife says to me, well, she's, she's all concerned about, about the relationship to God. She says, well, do you think it's God, or do you think it's uh, aliens? I said, well, I'm really not too sure, but whatever it is, God's in charge. Don't worry about it. And then she was all happy. She went running off. But what happens is Ray goes home, and this was on like a lectured uh, the conference ended on the Sunday, and it was like on the Tuesday or something. He's driving in um, Miami. He's driving to work. He's in a traffic jam, and that's when he gets the download. He gets his own download where he says suddenly he's there, and there's these aliens, and there's this big huge wheel that's spinning like a, like a like a roulette roulette wheel, and it's spinning. And he's watching this thing, he's in the middle of it, and they're sort of pointing out, and on the wheel are all different um, sort of segments. And one is uh, non-local consciousness, one is quantum physics, one is uh, telepathy, one is this. And basically, the download that he's getting is to say that it's all the same thing, which is basically the same download I got, was it's all, it's all non-local consciousness. So he gets this, this idea that it's all connected and if you see the book the, the index to my book that's what I basically say it's all the same thing it's the same crap it's just a different day so whether you're talking psychic phenomena whether you're talking channeling whether you're talking mediums whether you're talking meditation psychedelics everybody's doing the same thing they're basically shutting down this this left brain they're they're stilling the mind and they're able to tap into this this kind of stuff so what Ray had done the same as with me is he had tapped into this and what's extremely important about this stuff is you got these people who are claiming that they're getting uh, the answer to everything, they have the answer to everything in the universe. And one of the chapters I do is on savants. And I say savants is probably the most interesting aspect of the whole thing that I looked at. Because what you get with savants is these autistic savants who, um, for example, one where they're doing calendar counting they'll do this counter count and they can't button their shirt they can't really talk very well they're rocking back and forth and so somebody will say okay the year 132,343 on July the 11th what day will that be and the kid will just look and go oh that's a Tuesday and the, the key is they're almost always right like in 99.9% .9 of the time they're absolutely right so the, the question is if they're right, they're ta they're tapping into this this, this sort of non-local field, and they're getting accurate information. So it's not just an idea that's coming in their head; it's very very accurate material. So if you get a savant who can't sort of uh, add and subtract five five and two, but they can tell you like give them two four-digit numbers against each other and multiply these two digit, four-digit numbers, or what's a, a twenty-digit prime and what's the next twenty-digit prime after that, these kids can can give you this kind of stuff. 
they're tapping into something which I think is, is extremely important for us to learn this technique that we can actually learn stuff through this technique and it's going to be very, very accurate material. It's not just good ideas. Those are fascinating comments, and uh, you know, I noted with your discussion on the savants, uh, both those from birth and also acquired savants, that the greater uh, the lessening of the influence of the left brain with its analytical, um, local information and causation focus, uh, the more powerful yeah. is the right brain and the conduit into the uh, non-local information. And also, just a really quick um, uh, return to your mention regarding downloads in ETs. I know from your book, your research into the findings and initiatives of two sisters, Audrey and Debbie Hewins, of Starborn Support. Uh, that's a contact to experience your support organizations you describe. And uh, they also have a radio program Starborn Support Radio broadcast on KGRA on Saturday nights from 10 p.m. to midnight with co-host team Michael Austin and Michael uh, Melton Austin um, Michael Austin Melton pardon me and Julia Yesner Weiss very interesting show uh, now your book has so many examples of musicians artists scientists researchers who have received this information uh, from a source outside their own brain but with a right brain conduit. I can't wait to mention some of the examples uh, when we return. Uh, also, I have one question to mention, and I hope that it isn't seen as a negative. Uh, do you believe that some of this non-localized information could be coming from a source, the potential of it becoming from a source in some cases that is fraudulently representative uh, represented rather fraudulently represented represented or malevolent in purpose okay you want me to do that now or after gee yes because we have three minutes to break <laughs> okay um, I'm very very skeptical of evil aliens uh, evil spirits um, some of the research I do there is um, and I say this is more important than UFOs as well this is the most important research there is and that is lucid dream research the re lucid dream research that was done at Stanford University by Dr. Uh, Stephen LaBerge and uh, they've been doing this where you get into a dream and you realize you're lucid and they have these people in the labs and they signal they can they signal back their eyes left right left right left right and and it'll appear on the uh, the EEG so they've done a lot of work since 1975 on, on lucid dream and he basically will will state what I state is that uh, you can manufacture evil um, uh, entities in your uh, dream world or in outer out of body experiences or in uh, near death experiences but he will say the same thing that they say when you look at the research that's done at John Hopkins University on psilocybin with dying cancer patients and stuff. They do an eight hour um, uh, session with people before they do give them the psilocybin, high dose psilocybin. And they say, when you have this experience, we're going to have two people in the room to help you. And uh, you may see an evil spirit, you may see the devil, you may see whatever. And we want you to be open and accept. And what they do is when the person starts going down the rabbit hole of the evil stuff, they say, okay, do not walk away, go towards it. And this is what they say in the lucid dream research as well, is that if you walk up to it and you give it a big hug and unconditional love, it will turn from the devil or an evil spirit into a person with a message that we create these things with our mind. And so that's basically what I would say is to look at those two different types of research because they deal with this all the time. These people that are doing psilocybin uh, are dealing with this every single day. They, they deal with this, this idea of evil spirits and evil things that you run into. And because the mind, it's all one. The mind is controlling it. It is, it is your universe. It is your mind that you can control this. And you, uh, if you realize it's all one, you can make these things go away and you can uh, take control of the situation. But we do create them with our mind. And so it's almost like if you have a near-death experience, if you see a, a, a demonic thing, our near-death near experience is evil. No, they're not. It's just that you're bringing your mind into that experience. And the mind, as, as Edgar Cayce said, the spirit is the life. The, the mind is the builder and the physical is the result. What an interesting response.
Hey everyone, to Global Newsmaker Focus on the KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station and the Global Radio Alliance. We are speaking today with guest Grant Cameron regarding his latest book, Inspired, The Paranormal World of Creativity. Grant's website is presidentialufo.com. And uh, Grant, as we return, uh, there is some research regarding Diane Hennessy Powell and her work and findings that you might like to discuss now. Yes, uh, I think it's. It, this is one of the better examples. When you were we were talking before about how the more left brain damage there is, uh, the stronger the ability to do telepathy or to uh, do calendar counting. These savants, they all have left brain damage, and the the, the ones that are the best are what are called nonverbal uh, autistics or savants. And these are people who can't talk, and they have to use uh, storyboards or little key, key punch uh, pads that they, they punch their answer in. If you go to Diane Hennessy Powell, she was a she's a, um, a neurologist and a psychologist trained at John Hopkins, uh, was at uh, Harvard um, um, Medical School. Uh, actually, I think worked with John John Mack. So she's got this interest in UFOs, but her basic thing is to work with. Uh, autistic savants and she has on her website you'll see she has the one that just sort of blows you away and this is a girl by the name of um, um, Haley and Haley she met her when she was 10 years old she's a, a uh, autistic nonverbal and she's the one that does the telepathy so what happens is uh, the reason you, you can't do telepathy is because your left brain is, is interfering, you have all this noise. But if the left brain is shut down like with her, uh, this is a girl, and they actually have the video there, that did 162 numbers in a row right. And she made seven mistakes the first time, and Diane said, uh, Haley, you've made seven mistakes. And then she went, and she redid them again and got it right the second time. So this is like basically is pure telepathy. And she's got a number of these kids, and they're all over the place. Now, the problem is, and this is a problem we have in ufology, but we have in, in consciousness as well, is that anything that's weird, nobody, that's, the scientific community doesn't want anything to do with it. So the scientific community says we're open to new ideas, but there's exceptions. And uh, this is one of the exceptions. So she can't get any funding. These kids are all over the place. And Haley's the one that she has. The other kid that she has is a um, a kid who's autistic, but he can he can talk. But he's very hyperactive. He's bouncing around. This is a kid who started reading when he was when he was four months old. At the age of uh, 14 months, he could uh, read seven languages. He couldn't, uh, and his parents could speak four, but he could do seven. He could do Arabic. He could do Chinese. He could do uh, Spanish. Uh, all these different languages. And this kid is now five years old and now does uh, eight languages and is basically pure, pure te uh, purely telepathic. So you'll see where she shows some experiments where he, they play a game and say, okay, here's, here's the target. And they give him the three numbers and he's playing a game. And he's sitting on the other side of his room and his mother's writing these numbers down. And that's the whole thing. It's, this kid is completely tapped into this thing. And yet he's the, these autistic kids that they have, they have a lot of problems because if you change anything, if you bring in uh, camera equipment to test them or whatever, it changes the environment and, and autistic kids can't stand any changes. So her, her research is extremely important to show this, uh, almost like this direct download because basically it's like channeling or uh, meditation. There's some people who are sort of good at it, some are better, and some are really good. It it's depends how good is your signal. So uh, a lot of people, for example, when I bring up channelers, uh, two experiences, they'll say, well, don't, don't lump in with the channelers. I'm not a channeler. They're all a bunch of frauds and stuff. And, and the point is that some channelers are better than other channelers. It's, it's basically how good is your signal. And the, the ones with the best signals are these savants and these uh, autistic kids. And I even had one that, uh, again, there's nothing you can do with this kid because um, uh, there's just no money. And there was a reporter, this girl, uh, I think she was about 11. She was in the United Arab Emirates. And she was basically like Haley. She was one of these girls where the newspaper went in and gave her um, different targets, whether it was a word target or said, what's the address of the newspaper? And this girl punched in the address of the newspaper, and it was a long, long number and a long street. Picked that off, uh, would say um, sentences. She could do entire sentences without the spaces in it, and she would 
do all this kind of stuff. Uh, what am I thinking? What what sentence am I thinking? And this girl was like purely telepathic. So I went back to the reporter and I said, can you do another story on this girl? Because this is very interesting stuff and it's very important research. And they didn't reply. It's basically like they did their one little story on the girl. And this girl's in the United Arab Emirates and nobody's even studying this girl. And she is one of these pure te telepathic uh, students that we could learn an awful lot by studying why is this happening, how does it happen, and uh, extremely important research when it comes to how does the mind work, uh, how do we tap into uh, this kind of stuff, how, uh, is there life after death, is there uh, the mind inside the brain, all these kind of questions can be answered by this kind of stuff, but the problem is that it's it, when, whenever it gets to that sort of uh, woo-woo stuff, uh, scientific people don't want to touch it because uh, they're going to lose their grants, they're going to lose their their uh, reputation, and there's even an, an example with um, the guy who won the Nobel Prize for superconductivities at Cambridge University, and his name escapes me, um, when he came out pro te te uh, telepathy, he was no longer allowed to work with graduate students. This is the guy who won the Nobel Prize, and so if you bring this up, you basically are in the doghouse. If you uh, say you believe in telepathy or this kind of stuff, uh, but there's a lot of this uh, very interesting material and a lot of very interesting examples uh, of different books, uh, different songs, that people would be floored to know where all this stuff's coming from. Everybody thinks it's coming, that the person was smart, they figured it out, and you start to realize that, that really that's not how it works, that the smart people really don't come up with this kind of stuff. So maybe I can give you a couple of examples of some of the really bizarre downloads that, that people have gotten. Yes, indeed. And you know, uh, you have so many examples in your book, including George Gershwin's uh, writing Rhapsody in Blue um, on a the entire idea of coming to him on a train ride from Boston. Uh, also, you have Sting uh, utilizing uh, during a Brazilian visit that ayahuasca and uh, then his creating the Rainforest Foundation. But now, Grant, very quickly before we go over some of this Nobel Prize winner material, I was fascinated by your um, research into ESP and telepathy uh, and the Stanford Research Institute, as well as other academic uh, and also U.S. and Russian government work on telepathy. You give a really fascinating case um, that was noted by uh, President uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, and that was the uh, search uh, by our government agencies uh, to find a downed Russian craft. And let me just see here. I believe it was a Tupolev. Let me note here the my notes yeah, on tup, that. Tup, Tupolev 22. Yeah. Yes. And and when Jimmy Carter tells the story, he has to protect the classified the, the classified information. So what he says, it was an American plane. And it had gone down in the, I think it was in the Congo, in northern Africa. Was that and, here? Mm -hmm. and, and we were trying, and we were trying to find it. So he changes the story from a, mm -hmm. a Russian plane to an American plane. And the reason they covered it was because the Tupolev 22 was a supersonic bomber that was uh, a Russian bomber. And what they had done is they had transformed it into an intelligence platform. And the CIA realized this thing had gone down. And so the race, the reason they went to remote viewers was they were desperate. They, they used the, the, the satellites from the, the, uh, the CIA satellites and NSA satellites and stuff like that, and they couldn't find the plane. And they were trying to get to it before the Russians got to it because it would have all the code books. It would have the latest uh, intelligence uh, uh, eavesdropping stuff inside this plane. So it was wow. a race to beat the Russians to this plane. And that's why they used the remote viewers. And there was actually two remote viewers. One was at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and the other one was at Stanford Research Institute. And they both picked up this target and they said it's under it's under the trees that's why you can't see it it's in a river and it's uh, the plane the tail of the the plane is sticking out of the river and when they gave the location the CIA was 60 miles away from the right location as soon as they got the location from the remote viewers they found this thing within hours and uh, of course what happened after that we really don't know you know what they recovered uh, but Jimmy Carter said it was the most amazing thing he'd seen as president and uh, so you can see that the Americans were, were using this kind of stuff and there was all sorts of examples if you listen to the SRI people who are running the program uh, Hal Putoff and, and Russell Targ were talking about uh, the, the remote viewing and, and the targets that they were picking up and even later on when they learned how to do the out of body remote viewing where uh, they had taught um, a woman 
um, to actually go, and they'd gone to to Gorbachev's office inside the Kremlin. And the the so the woman's in this out of body experience state, and he's saying, "Okay, where are you now?" She says, "I'm at this door, and it's got leather on it, and it's got uh, buttons." sort of golden buttons pushed into the leather and he said okay go in and, and then they're in Gorbachev's office and there's a big desk and there's a window on the left hand side and there's a door okay go into the door and they go into the door and, and down the stairs and there's uh, there's sort of like a computer type thing in the basement and later on they actually got to go to the Russian to uh, Gorbachev to the, the, the Prime Minister's office and that's exactly the, the target with, she was dead on on all this kind of stuff so they were doing this kind of stuff that was highly, highly accurate. And the reason they had to shut this stuff down, of course, there's a lot of people inside the CIA who were very Christian-oriented and believed this was demonic. And they wanted to shut down. And the other reason they shut it down was because it was shut down by a guy by the name of Dr. Ronald Pandolfi, who was the guy who ran the weird desk at the CIA. It was called the phenomenology desk or the, the, the weird desk where all the uh, paranormal phenomena, all the ghosts, all the UFO stuff, it was all coming through this, this one department, and he was running it. And he shut it down because it was it was this idea of running a public program where you have to answer for everything. People is starting to leak. The story's starting to leak. So what you do is you say, like almost like they did with the UFO program in 1969, they say, uh, we've done an analysis of this. It's all garbage. We don't believe it. And we're shutting the program down. Now you don't have to put somebody out to an answer for every stupid UFO sighting. You can now do it in the dark. You can keep researching it. And nobody knows what you're doing but as long as you have an open program where it's it's leaking where, where, you, where you're keeping paperwork that everybody's access to this paperwork you have to shut it down so uh, the remote doing stuff was extremely important and the Russians were big time into this and from what the people at SRI were saying is if it hadn't been for the Russians, the Americans would never would have gotten into it. But they heard that the, the Russians were doing all sorts of experiments where they would put somebody into a bank and the, the guy would do this sort of a hypnosis thing just by looking at somebody and his, his job was, can you go into the bank and get the person to give you all the money? And when they heard that the Russians were doing this kind of stuff and this whole idea, can we influence American presidents with, uh, with the mind, then the Americans got into it. But the Americans, I think, um, always had a black program on this because as one of the part of my download was uh, a document flashed into my mind which was a Canadian government UFO document from 1950 when the Canadians go to the Americans and they ask them what's going on with flying saucers and the Americans through classified channels tell the Canadians and this is recorded in a top secret Canadian government document said flying saucers exist it's the most highly classified subject in the United States it's of tremendous significance to the Americans and they're not, and um, there's a small group trying to figure out this whole thing out. And the Americans have told us that other things might be associated with the flying saucers, such as mental phenomena. They're not doing very well because they've said if we're working on it, they're willing to exchange credentials and talk to us about this. So the Americans knew in 1950 that mental phenomena was a big part of the UFO phenomena. And I believe they realized that because in 1947, the evidence seems now to indicate that they recovered a live alien at Roswell, New Mexico. And the live alien was telepathic. And it was talking in people's heads. And I think that may be the most classified part of the UFO thing, is this whole telepathic uh, idea. So when they've got this alien that's telepathic, they suddenly realize, like, wow, if we could tap into this kind of stuff. So I think they've been working on it almost since day one. And uh, it's uh, it all fits together when you start to see uh, the fact that telepathy is is key to this thing. And if you look at the experiencers, 14% of all experiencers, and the, and the free people actually, I, I talked to them a lot about this. They've actually now got a survey where they're actually going to deal just a new survey, and they're going to deal just with the 42% are getting the downloads. Because I said, why don't we interview these people? Why don't we cross-index these things and, and look at, at what they're getting? Because I actually had one case where I discovered the, the similarity. The, the, the witnesses didn't. One girl told me a story that she was on a, on a flying saucer, and she was talking to the aliens, and the aliens were talking to her about cancer. And the aliens said, oh, cancer is something the cure to cancer is something you use every single day. And she's saying, well, is it like toothpaste? And she's guessing away, and they, they're not really telling her. And she said, suddenly this 3D holographic image of a formula starts to come out. And she said it was so big and it was so 3D, you could actually walk inside and around this formula. So she tells that story. And then there's another guy from Las Vegas, Nevada, who's telling the story. And I hear it independently. And he says, he's sitting there, he's talking to the aliens. And he says to them, 
what's your concept of God? And he was not a friend. He was he did he was really angry at the at the Grace because they'd taken his child, they had taken his his girlfriend. She had had the baby, and they took the baby. And uh, he was very upset about this whole thing. And so he wasn't a friend of the Grays, but so he confronted them. He said, what's your concept of God? And he said, the tall gray said to him, we are one with the one who is all. And he said, wow, he was just blown away by it. He couldn't believe it. And he said, as soon as he said that, and he was over, overwhelmed by the, the, the sort of the, the, the meaning of that phrase, he said, suddenly this 3D holographic image of a formula starts coming out of the wall. And he said, the, the guy says to him, the troll says, you got a disease on your planet. It's called cancer. And he said, yes, we do. And he said, this is the, this is the um, formula for the, for the cure to cancer. And, and so uh, the guy says, well, really? And he's saying, well, this has been worth it. I mean, all this pain I've gone through with these grays is worth it. He said, give me a piece of paper. I want to write this down. And the, and the tall gray says, no, you can't write it down. You have to remember it. He said, well, I can't remember it. Give me a piece of paper. i got to write it down. They said, no, you have to remember it. And he said, I'm, I'm not good at math. I can't remember this. I need a piece of paper. And he said he got so upset that they, issued, they, uh, they ushered him out of the room. So you have these two people who are both talking about the fact that the aliens gave them this 3D holographic image of a formula that was to cure cancer. So I actually put up, I said, I will put up the money. For you two people, I was going to fly them to Las Vegas, Nevada. I was going to bring in Yvonne Smith. She was going to fly in from Los Angeles. And I said, I, I can live with the fact that these formulas are not going to be the same. I cannot live with the fact that I had a chance to put these two people in a room and regress them and go to the formula and see whether it was the same formula. And then what happened, they, they both agreed, and then they started backing off because it was like, oh, you know, they're sort of afraid. Do I, what's going to come out? I don't know if I want to go through this, whatever. And I said... We're not going to go to your childhood. We're not going to do anything probing you or whatever. I'm paying for this. We're going to the formula. We're going to put you under hypnosis. We're going straight to the formula, and then we're going out. And if you want to ask any other questions, that's fine. We'll put those questions in. All I want is the formula. And they never did go through with it. But you have these kind of examples of downloads that people are getting that might actually be the cure to cancer, that this stuff, we may actually have it. But in the UFO community, unfortunately, nobody will deal with free. Uh, MUFON really doesn't want to deal with them. UFO Congress really doesn't want to deal with them. Uh, major uh, interview shows do not want to deal with them. And the, 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 what they say is, well, these people, their experiences, yeah, but they just believe their experiences. They just believe they've had these experiences talking to, to aliens. And I go, yeah, that's true. They just believe they're, but you just believe that people have seen UFOs. You just believe you're a skeptic. You just believe the stuff that you heard in school in science was right. It's all belief. Yes, it's sure, it's belief. Let's at least talk to these people, find out whether they're lying. Don't you think there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these people who are getting these downloads? Don't you think we should talk to these people? But the UFO community will not talk to these people. The free organizations doing it, but they don't have any money. They don't have any uh, ability to uh, do anything with this. And so a lot of times, you know, people will complain we're not getting anywhere. And I say, in a lot of cases, we deserve to be in the dark. Because we're doing some really stupid things. We will not progress until we start opening up and following the data. And this, is, to me, is the most important data in the UFO community is these experiencers who are telling these bizarre stories or the 14%. And they haven't agreed to this yet. But I said, we should talk to the 14% of experiencers. I've talked to three dozen of them who have flown the ship. And, and so Ray said in this conference call, he said, well, Grant, lots of people have been on the ship. I said, yeah, I don't care if they've been on the ship, Ray. I, when, when they're on the ship, fine. But once they start flying the flying saucer, then we're talking something different because they're all saying the same thing. Everybody will say the same thing. They'll say, I was flying this ship. I say, okay, stop. How do you fly a flying saucer? Nobody, 100%, nobody has said anything different. They all say, oh, you do it with your mind. The craft is alive. You fly it with your mind. And they talk about putting their hand on this, this the beehive type thing or a flat... Um, pad or a beehive type thing and as soon as they put their hand on they become one with the ship uh, it, things start to happen inside the ship the ship gets bigger uh, the window opens up and they're actually able to actually move through time and space that when they see a cloud they can look at a cloud and they say I'd like to go to the cloud and the cloud comes to them and they, they describe and this is described in near-death experiences as well 
you start seeing these very direct similarities between these stories people are saying. I say, don't you think we should talk to people when they're talking about flying the ship? How you have this symbiotic relationship between the being, uh, the person, the craft, and, and, and this is how you move the ship around. Extremely important stuff, but unfortunately in the UFO community, we're still very much into nuts and bolts and watching lights in the sky and stuff like that. And nobody really wants to go to this, you know, woo-woo stuff of uh, people who are claiming some pretty bizarre stuff. Grant, that's fascinating. You know, I tremendously agree with you that we need the full spectrum and extent of the information that can be gleaned from these people to appreciate the subject and its importance and significance to our lives. Now, Grant, your work notes the importance of the two factors of consciousness and quantum entanglement, almost like themes in your work. Also, uh, your book again speaks of those concepts of the primacy of consciousness and the importance of oneness, as you referenced. Now, I note your research even includes discussions at the 5th, 1920s, 27 Solve Conference on Electrons and Photons. This conference was attended by 29 physicists, 17, 17 of who would receive the Nobel Prize or had already won a Nobel Prize. Now, quoting your book, it was in presentations at this conference that Wolfgang Pauli, Niels Bohr, and Werner Heisenberg raised the idea that consciousness might be the basis of the universe and that matter could only come into existence with an observer, end quote. I see a connection here. Yeah, and that, that's extremely important. That is the critical thing that people have to realize, the importance of all this consciousness stuff in u ufology, is that you have two lo you have a laws of the universe. So the laws of the universe used to be Newtonian laws. Separate objects moving around in time and space, random, meaningless, uh, or you have a situation and local causation that Einstein believed in, where the only time uh, an object will be affected is if it's hit by another object or is uh, there's a force field that moves the object. So local causation. So what happens at the 27th Solvay Conference is you have uh, um, Bohr and Heisenberg stand up and they make this contention based upon uh, the, the dual slit experiment that when you, when you have a, an observer, the particles appear on the back wall. And when you take the observer off, when you try, you, you, you don't measure it, then it turns back to a wave. And so the idea was that particles, a particle will only take a position in time and space when there's an observer. And as soon as they made, the, we're making this presentation at the 27 Solvay Conference, this big debate between Bohr and Heisenberg, which is very interesting if you read on the internet. It goes on for their whole life. And they have this debate back and forth. And, Heis, and Eisenstein stands up during the lecture and he says, this is not right. This is not right because it's non. Now it's no no longer non-local consciousness. It means that an observer, like in the the uh, experiment that's done with the entangled particles, you can have an, a, a particle on one end of the universe, one on the other end of the universe. If you change the spin of the one particle, the other one will change, which is not local ca causation. It means that the mind can change these things, or that the one particle is ca the particles are conscious. And the one particle knows what you did to the other particle, and it changes its spin. And I, Einstein couldn't stand this, because it, it, it destroyed local causation, which is the objects in time and space, and speed of light, and all that kind of stuff. And so, in, in the and, and he's, he said to Bohr, and I was actually trying to find the quote today, I still haven't been able to find it again, but he said to Bohr, he said, you are not going to drag mysticism into the world of physics. Because he knew exactly where this was going. This is Eastern philosophy. This is the whole idea of uh, oneness of the universe, of the uh, samadhi experience, of uh, everything being connected. And so particles are connected on each of the sides of the universe, and you can change one, and the other one will change. And he knew that everything that he believed was going to go down. So you have this debate between the idea of quantum uh entanglement, the, the idea that everything is one, that uh, consciousness is the basis of the universe, or you have Newtonian. And so in, in, the scientific, in the scientific world and in ufology, we are following the Newtonian physics, the old physics. And you can only have one law of the universe. So it's either going to be quantum or it's going to be Newtonian. And basically it's quantum. 
and Newtonian is wrong. This whole idea that you can you can measure things. So that's where we have run into the problem in the UFO community is people will say, well, you got to be able to measure it. You got to be able to weigh it. You've got to be able to touch it. And they're talking about this local causation, particles in time and space, and saying if it doesn't have that, if you can't measure it, well, then it doesn't exist. Well, according to Heisenberg. And starting in 1925, you have the uncertainty principle. You can't measure anything. It, it's this, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, quantum potentials. And so when you see the UFO world and the consciousness world, it starts to negate the the Newtonian world, and you have to start looking at things from a, a perspective of quantum physics and not particles in time and space. Well, that is fascinating information and research there. Now, Grant, we have about, uh, I'd say, three or four minutes to the end of the show. You know, you have such extensive and excellent examples of people receiving information from that non-localized source. I know one Nobel Prize winner with an interesting UFO connection, here quoting your book on Kerry Mullis and his 1993 Nobel Prize Award in Chemistry, here quoting directly, Kerry Mullis was the winner of the 1993 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his invention of a process that allows scientists to classify DNA genetic code fragments, such as from a crime scene, mummified body, or woolly mammoth frozen in a glacier, and then reproduce it in vast quantities. The download came as Mullis was driving at night to his cottage in the Anderson Valley in North California. Uh, end quote. Interesting connection there. Yeah, plus he was an experiencer. He was, uh, he was, uh, tells a story, he goes to the cottage, and he said, um, he gets out, and suddenly he's talking to the glowing raccoon. And the glowing raccoon says, Good evening, Dr. Mullis. And he says, and, and then he says, next thing he, wa- he realized, he's woken up in the morning, and he's missing like six hours of time or whatever. And so he says, he puts a, 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 a gets his gun. And he starts looking for the little effer, and he goes into the outhouse, because he was going to the out- outhouse when, when this happened. And he said, I was hoping that little thing would be in there, because I always shoot him. And, and then he, he goes through, the, and he has these experiences. And then his daughter comes to the cottage, and she has a missing time experience. And so he's describing his missing time experience, and she gives him the book communion, and she said, Dad... I think you should read this book. So he is actually a, a, an ET experiencer, and he's sort of one of these people that the, the scientific community sort of puts up with because he won the Nobel Prize, but he's seen to be a, like a total flake because he has these not only the, the download thing, but he has the uh, um, the abduction thing. Plus, he also did the um, – he was doing LSD. So um, he they asked him, would you have this made this uh, discovery if you hadn't done LSD? And he said, no, I don't think so. I, it, didn't, it didn't give me the invention. He said, but it allowed me to walk around inside the molecule and see what was going on. So he has these bizarre things. And it's all the same thing. It's, like, uh, it's almost like the DNA. There was a, a story that the DNA was invented. Uh, the the idea for the double helix came when uh, Crip or whatever the guy's name was 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 doing LSD. That that's where he got the download of the DNA. So you see these these crossovers and uh, piles and piles of uh, of examples of these things. I'll, I'll name a couple of the ones I find interesting. Harry Potter. Most people don't really realize that all Harry all seven books of the Harry Potter series came in an instant. The same has happened to me. Came in an instant on a train going from Manchester into London to J.K. Rawlings. And she said, I didn't have a pen, and I'm sitting there, and I'm trying to write this down, and all these ideas and all these names are coming into my head. Everything came to her, including the last line of the book, came to her in a split second after waking up from, from a dream. Same as The Wizard of Oz. The guy was telling the story to his kids, and he said suddenly this, The Wizard of Oz, the story of Wizard of Oz, downloaded into his head, and he had no paper, and he's mad, he's using envelopes that he was finding to write the story down as it, as it came into his head. And the one that I, I, people always dispute, this is the one with the, the Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 Steps and 12 Traditions, the book. Uh, Wilson, who wrote the book, at one point claimed to his minister that he got the book, that it was given to him off an Ouija board from a 15th century monk by the name of Boniface. And you see these stories over and over. This, the Google the invention of Google, they're one of the biggest companies in the world. If, if you listen to uh, uh, Page, he gives a speech at, 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 at his alma mater for the commencement, and he tells a story. It all came in a dream in the middle of the night. And he said, sometimes you've got to stop dreaming and start writing stuff down. And he was quickly writing this down. That's where the idea for Google came. It came in the middle of the night to him in a dream. 
remarkable information. Now, uh, Grant, uh, discussion tonight, again, only reflects a microcosm in the information in your new book, Inspired, the Paranormal World of Creativity. In about one minute, we're closing out, but my question to you is, uh, when will people be able to read this book, the public? It, it's on the um, it's on uh, Amazon right now. You can get the the Kindle. I think is four ninety nine or something. I made it low so people can can get the Kindle. It's on the on Amazon, and I've just heard from my editor that the music book. This started out as a music book, and mm-hmm. there was just uh, when I suddenly realized mm-hmm. there was all these other inventions, I changed it and made the music book a separate book. The music book will probably be out within the next month. So I have a an, a second book which is all music. Downloads. Excellent. I'll note those links at my site, too. And again, Grant, thank you so for joining us this evening to discuss your new book. Uh, and uh, thank you, listeners, for joining us this evening for this wonderful program. Hope you're having wonderful pre-Christmas and Hanukkah holiday days there. And also, everyone, don't forget to hear the two wonderful programs immediately following Truth Theorem Radio Unleashed and Q Science Project with Jill Hansen. Grant, again, thank you so very much. Uh, goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Leah. Thanks, Mel. You guys had a great show. Everybody in chat was loving it. And to both of you, happy holidays, happy new year, and may be always blessed with peace and uh, health and everything else. So. Beautiful. Thank God you God bless you, Bill and Grant. Thank you again, so. God bless you. Have a great night. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.